Good evening, and welcome to the Coolidge Corner Theater for the 2019 Coolidge Award honoring Julianne Moore. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the Coolidge Corner Theater Chair of the Board, Michael Maynard. Good evening, welcome. We're delighted to see all of you frequent friends, fans, and supporters here tonight uh, for a wonderful evening. Welcome to the Coolidge and the 2019 Coolidge Award. Thank you for joining us as we honor an extraordinary actress whose remarkable body of work embodies the highest ideals of our award, Julianne Moore. And as you'll hear probably later on in a few stories here and there, uh, a graduate of Boston University. <laughs> Ms. Moore joins a prestigious and very select group of artists who have received this honor since the award's inception in 2004. Previous honorees include Meryl Streep, Viggo Mortensen, Michael Douglas, and Jane Fonda. Legendary film editor Thelma Schoonmaker, directors Jean Imo, Werner Herzog, and Jonathan Demme, and the great cinematographer Vittorio Storaro. They are a diverse group, representing a broad range of artistry, but they have all changed the way we watch films. And the act of watching films is one of the many things we're here to celebrate tonight. For the past 86 years, the Coolidge Corner Theater has used cinema as a vehicle to entertain and enlighten audiences, to create memories and community. And it is that commitment to building community through film culture that has sustained us through the decades as we have evolved from a grand movie palace starting in 1933 to a repertory house once slated for destruction but saved by the community in 1989. And you'll hear more about that this fall with the celebration of the 30th anniversary. But again, we were saved by the community to the beloved, thriving organization that we are today. So thank you all for your support. We would not be here without this community, and we are grateful that you choose to support our independent nonprofit theater. I'd also like to extend special thanks to some key individuals who have been instrumental in making tonight possible. They are longtime Coolidge board member Rick Larson, the visionary behind the Coolidge Award. Rick is here tonight and continues to be a board member. The generous sponsors listed in your program with special thanks to Georgia and Bruce Johnson and Design Within Reach. And of course, the incredible Coolidge staff who create and deliver remarkable programs for you and our community 365 days here. And And now please join me in welcoming the force behind today's thriving organization and our executive director and CEO, Kathy Tallman. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Many thanks to all of you. I'm so happy to share this special event with you, one of several connected with the Coolidge Award. We had a screening this afternoon of Gloria Bell, followed by a Q&A, delightful Q&A, where Julianne charmed all of us um, with the conversation. We simply can't do what we do without you, so I'd say give yourselves a hand, but there'll be a lot of reasons to applaud. The Coolidge Award recognizes a film artist whose work represents original and outstanding contributions to cinema. Our 13th Coolidge Award honoree, it's a lucky number, began her film career around the same time the Coolidge was saved from the wrecking ball by a group of dedicated cinephiles and community members, we reverently call them the 89ers, including Harold Brown and David Kleiler, both of whom just recently passed away. I'd like to give a special welcome tonight to David Kleiler Jr., who's with us tonight with his wife. The Coolidge was formed as a nonprofit, and David became our first executive director. 
He had a vision for the Coolidge as a beacon of independent cinema. One of his boldest and most memorable early programming choices was Louis Malle's Vanya on 42nd Street, which features a luminous performance by Julianne Moore. The film still holds the record as our longest running film. We haven't showed it for a while either. I think we should bring that back. Along with her electrifying turns in Robert Altman's Shortcuts and Todd Haynes' Safe, Vanya established Julianne Moore as one of the boldest and most exciting actresses working in independent film. Just as it is impossible to imagine film culture in Boston without the Coolidge, it is equally difficult to fathom the last three decades of independent film without Julianne Moore. She has forged a singular career, appearing in nearly 70 films, often portraying women for whom the description complex is an understatement. Oh, I mean, it, you know, it's kind of redundant, don't you think women are a complex anyway, but she does a great, great job <laughs> of showing all of us. Her many roles include a cocaine-fueled porn star and maternal figure, a 1950s housewife suffocated by social convention, the tough and intelligent leader of an underground rebel group, a renowned linguistics professor acutely aware that her brilliant mind is slipping away, which earned her an Academy Award, a Sarah Palin that transcended impersonation and humanized a well-known punchline, Maude Lebowski, <laughs> who prompts hysterical laughter from a sold-out audience at every annual screening at the Coolidge. This year is August 19th. Get your tickets, it will sell out. And soon, feminist icon Gloria Steinem. Even in her most ordinary roles, Julianne Moore brings remarkable and nuanced emotional depth to every scene. She's unafraid to show vulnerability and pain, is equally adept at channeling joy and lightness, and seamlessly transitions between the two, between the many, I should say. A New York Times interview described her as smart, funny, and down to earth. She acknowledged that she put a lot of stock in Flaubert's sage advice, be regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. <laughs> and so she has. In David Cronenberg's Map to the Stars, in Savage Grace, Carrie, Gloria Bell, countless roles, she provides stunning examples of someone thrillingly unafraid to step out of her comfort zone to create thoroughly authentic characters. She has been outspoken about the need for films to show a wider spectrum of women's experiences and change the traditional Hollywood depiction of midlife. In a recent interview about Gloria Bell, she noted, it's important to see women at different stages. Just because you get older, you don't know everything, and it's not like you stop living. Life is not about staying young. It's about being alive. She has brought the same level of vitality, compassion, and commitment to her humanitarian work, using her roles, public persona, and actions to speak out for women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and common sense gun control. She is the author of seven children's books, the Freckle Face Strawberry Series, based on her childhood nickname, that champions self-acceptance and has been a spokesperson for Stomp Out Bullying. And we can claim her as one of our own, an alum of BU's College of Fine Arts, and honing her Boston accent while working at the Up and Up Lounge above the Howard Johnson's in Kenmore Square. <laughs> <laughs> and now, for a body of work that reflects the Coolidge's mission to entertain, enlighten, and build community around film culture, for her adventurous approach to her art, for the passion and joy she brings to her work on and off screen, for combining excellence in art with a strong social commitment that opens our eyes and generates empathy, the Coolidge salutes a consummate artist, Julianne Moore. Let's take a look at the clip reel produced by Coolidge staffer Ann Continelli. Take it away. And what does it bring you here tonight? Well, we're here to celebrate you. Really? You're really talented. You're a transformative figure. You are refined. Beauty, I'm an actor. 
What can I say? I'd be delighted. I never loved him. I never loved him, Earl. When I met him, when I started, I met him, I fucked him, and I married him because I wanted his money. You understand? Uh, I'm telling you this, um, this I've never told anyone. Uh, I, I didn't love him, but but now you know. I I know I'm in that will. I mean, we were all there together. We made that fucking thing and all the money I get, and, and I don't I don't want it because I love him so much now. I fall in love with him now, for real, as he's dying. And um, I look at him, and he's about to go, Alan. He's moments. He, he... It's complete bullshit. You don't have all. Damn it! Anxiety. Why won't you take me seriously? No, I know what I'm feeling. I know what it's feeling, and, and it feels like my brain is fucking dying. And everything I've worked for in my entire life is going. I miss my two sons, you know. I miss my, my little Andrew and and my Dirk. You know, I always felt like Dirk was my my baby, my new baby. How could you be so rude, Arnold? For what? I was introducing you to my family. I brought you to my son's birthday party, you and you had the nerve would have done to just the same disappear? Thing. It wasn't an easy situation. Really? I searched for your eyes again and again. I didn't exist. We were in love. Oh, please. We were in love. He didn't How many he times was, he did he have wrong. to say that? He was, he was, he... It made me sick. Do you like sex, Mr. Lebowski? Sex, the physical act of love, coitus. Do you like it? I was talking about my rug. You're not interested in sex? You mean coitus? I like it too. It's a male myth about feminists that we hate sex. It can be a natural, zesty enterprise. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh... Ooh. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I. Jules. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go and... It's okay. Oh, I just, uh, I... It's okay. It's okay. But I shall return! I never understood how you got over it so quickly. You think I got over it? No one could get over it. I live with it. I yeah, think about come on, him I mean, every the way you just day. You don't have on. a monopoly on suffering, you know. You always carry this memory like a ball. Well, you fucking chain. know about I always my memories. You don't oh, know what close. I feel or what... Oh, yeah, there you go. It's what you always do. When it gets tough, you walk away. This is our stop. You found it. Yeah, I found it hanging off one of the birches out back. It was so windy. I was going back into the house, and it just sailed off my neck. I had a feeling it might be yours. Now, who else could have been so absent-minded? No, no, it's the color. It just seemed right. Well, thank you, Mr. Deegan, for finding it. There it is. No one's going to forgive me. It was death. I chose life. Is he dead, Dr. Lecter? Who changed those orders? Get away from the car. Ah! He kissed me, and I kissed him back. Please don't be kind to me. It only makes it worse. Julianne Moore. It's Julianne Moore! Julianne Moore still out. She's amazing. And she is just as genuinely nice as she is, well, on the screen, she's even nicer off. Please join me now in welcoming to the stage Julianne Moore and journalist Lauren King. Thank you so much. Thank you. My God. 
you so much. That was really lovely. To all those lovely things, and and it was like watching my life flash before my eyes. Um, there are some jobs I don't even remember. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Well, program. it's a rousing Boston welcome. And welcome back. Thank you very much. Yes. So nice to be back. Yes, yeah. is it? Have you had a, a good return? Yeah. It's been a while, yeah, right? Yeah, it has. But I mean, I was... Um, I was actually in Boston briefly last last fall, but you know it had been years really, mm -hmm. and, and I love I love it here, mm -hmm. and there are so many memories, and there's so many yeah. things that are still the same, yeah. and so many things that have changed completely. Mm -hmm. But what was really remarkable was when I walked in upstairs earlier today, and I went, "Oh my God, this is where I saw a racer head." Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I could yeah. I could actually I could see where I was sitting. That, is, that was that's crazy. Great. Yes. It was crazy. I love that. Yes. So those were good years when you were at Boston University. Yeah, they were pretty good. You know, it's college. Mm -hmm. So um, who remembers? <laughs> um, it, it was, I think I really, it's, Boston is such a great place to go to school, mm -hmm. though. I mean, it really is. A, mm -hmm. It's a wonderful city. It's an accessible city. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's easy to, to get around. I had a lot of great jobs. The program was great and intense. And... Um, yeah, so I have a lot of fond memories and went back there today, actually, yeah. in between. We, I had a little break, so I went back and talked to the, the, the students. I think they're mostly they'll be, they're going to be graduating really yeah. soon yeah. and try yeah. to, wow. in an hour, give them life <laughs> advice. <laughs> so, but it's, you know, yeah, but it's very touching. Cause but did you want time. to go to Boston University to live in Boston? I didn't know what I wanted. Okay. I had, um, I, I... My dad was in the army. We had moved to Germany, and you know, acting was my after-school thing. You know, because I couldn't do sports, and I didn't make like drill team or cheerleading or anything like that. So you had to do something after school. So something that I really loved. But when I got to Germany, um, I had a there was a really wonderful and very ambitious, uh, you know, acting teacher. Her the first production she did was um, Tartuffe, Moliere's Tartuffe. I'd never even heard of Moliere. Uh -huh. And but anyway, I would you know I would always do all these plays with her yeah. and. After about a year, she handed me a copy of Dramatics Magazine and it had these different theater schools in it and said, I think you can be an actor. Mm -hmm. I think that you could make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. So I came home and said to my parents, I'm going to be an actor <laughs> and I'm going to choose a school from this magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. So I applied to NYU, yeah. BU, and Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because they seemed, sounded good. And my mom and I flew back to New York, and my first audition was at NYU, and I walked in, they said, how old are you? And I said, I was 18. They said, this is a graduate program. I'd filled out the wrong form. Because that's what kids did, they filled right. it out ourselves yeah. those days. Yeah. So my mother... <laughs> My mother said, it's too dangerous here. You're not allowed to go here anyway, so forget it. So we left, and then um, I auditioned for Carnegie in New York City, and then we flew to Boston. Mm -hmm. I auditioned at, you know, at the actual building where SFA is. Okay. Um, I had on dress pants and a silk blouse, and all the other kids had leotards on in like, <laughs> in like the dance part. It was like, oh, it was, everything was wrong. But anyway, I liked Boston mm -hmm. a lot and I never bothered to visit Pittsburgh because I didn't know where it was exactly. <laughs> and that's why I ended up yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, Kathy alluded to the Up and Up Lounge. Yes. So let's talk about that and oh. uh, what that was like. That was the one at the top floor of the, the Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson's, mm -hmm. for those of you who remember. Right in Kenmore was, Square. Yeah, in yeah. Kenmore Square. You can see the Sitco sign yeah. from from the, um, from the Up and Up Lounge, uh, from the windows, and also you can see the Charles River. Mm -hmm. And I was hired there my first summer after freshman year when I decided I was gonna stay and work. Okay. And I wandered in and I was, I guess, 19. Wow. And so then they hired me and I was underage, but nobody cared then. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was 1980. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, they were great and I worked as a cocktail waitress there all the way through college and was wow. eventually promoted to being an assistant bartender and I work a double shift on Saturday nights from two in the afternoon till two in the morning when the bar is, the bar is still closed two in the morning here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> Amateurs. <laughs> it's four in New in York. In New York, yeah. So when I got, when I waited tables there, I was like, are you kidding me? I've got to yeah. keep going till four. <laughs> 
so it yeah. was a it was it was a great yeah. job. Yeah. I loved I loved being there. You must have heard a lot of good Boston accents, and oh, of course of you did one of the best that. ones yeah. as Nancy Donovan yeah, in you. Thirty Rock. Thank you. Whatever happened to your Boston accent? You were a liar, Nancy Donovan. I never had a Boston accent. What about you, Loudmouth? What Southy piece of trash did you trick into marrying you? I have you know that my husband happens to be a very prominent Pakistani anesthesiologist. No, I'm kidding you. He's an Irish moron, runs a roofing company. So if you need your roof done, call someone else, because my guy is not reliable. <laughs> you know, it's going away. It is? Boston accent. Yeah. It's going yeah. away. I think regionalisms in general mm -hmm. are have declined, you know, all, all over, you know, just because of, I, th I think because of TV, yeah. the way we all yeah. listen to each other, and yeah. yeah. Kathy also, in, in that lovely speech, uh, alluded to Vanya on 42nd Street, which played here, and I remember seeing it here. It was here forever. It was here for That's over so a year. Cool. Um, how important was that you did the theater production with Andre Gregory, mm -hmm. then, of course, you did the film with Louis Mal, but right. the, the um, theater production went on for a really long time. A really long it? time, and it's funny, because I should have tried to talk to the kids at BU about uh -huh. stuff that didn't come up, and it was, I know. And um, it, was an, it was an interesting time in my life as an actor because I had been, you know, I had moved to New York and I'd worked primarily in, tel you know, I had a job on a soap opera. I'd worked there for three yeah. years and then I got off the soap opera and I worked at the Guthrie Theater, did Hamlet there and then Actors Theater of Louisville and then I was doing a play at the Public Theater. And while I was there, um, Mabu Mines was uh, sharing dressing rooms with Mar Mabu Mines was a, an experimental theater group mm -hmm. in New York City that Joanne Acolytus was a, a member of. Um, so I happened to know that stage manager, and a girlfriend of mine said that Jack Doolin had said, come meet Andre Gregor for this production of Uncle Vanya. And Jack Doolin didn't ask me, so I wandered over, because my girlfriend and I would share information about auditions, and I wandered over to Jack, and I was like, why didn't I, why don't I get to meet Andre Gregory? I want to meet him too. And he was like, well, I think you're in between, I don't think you're a Yelena, and I don't think you're a Sonia. And I was like, well, I want to meet him anyway, I just want to meet him. And um, I went and met him, and at the end of the conversation, he said, what are you doing this summer? I said, I think I have to make some money, because I've been doing a bunch of theater. He said, why don't you stay and do this production of this workshop? Yeah. It was supposed to be like a, a, a two-month workshop of yeah. Vanya, and it turned into five years. Five years. Yeah. Wow. We'd like take a break and then come back and do it the next summer, mm -hmm. and then do it like for a week, you know, over uh, like, Thanksgiving holidays, or and then again in the spring, and um, and and because it was so long, it really was that that tradition of like working on something. You know, Stanislavski says either do it like in you know six days or or in six months or something. We really this was five years. We got it was so familiar after yeah. a while, and so broken yeah. down, and so um, conversational, and so non. Um, oh, result oriented. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it was a it was an opportunity, yeah. really for the first time in my life, yeah. to do something where there was no, we weren't anticipating any kind of a result, okay. and it really changed the way I acted. Really. Yeah. And it's so unusual to have that kind of experience in the theater. Oh God. So it, it sounds like that helped be, helped you become a film actress because it did. It did. Well, you know. It's, it is interesting because even though uh, there are a lot of actors who feel very, very free on stage mm -hmm. and they feel that um, that's where they're really kind of able to, to, to bring a, a, a full characterization. For me in the theater, I always felt that the, the, even though you have this rehearsal period, it was, you know, oddly you get rushed into tech and then suddenly previews and then you're performing and you have to, it has, it has to gel, it has yeah. to come together. You can't fail. Yeah. But here we were on stage in front of people because Andre would invite all these people to come and see us and famous people like Baryshnikov and Robert Altman yeah. and yeah. Susan Sontag came once. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they would talk to us because yeah. Andre wanted them to talk to us while we were there and it was really uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> really uncomfortable. But you, it broke you down so much. So back to the theater thing, like yeah. we, you know, I, I, we could never, you could never get there. You couldn't, yeah. it was just like, how do I feel comfortable just behaving? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that, then that became where I was most comfortable. Yeah. And that really did, I think, transition into me being yeah. comfortable on camera mm -hmm. and being a film actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, because you would often change night to night 
it wouldn't always be the same performance. And in, I've, I've, yeah. I've heard you talk about how on film you like, you don't like to do a ton of takes, right? I don't, although I've gotten better at doing a ton of takes because some people like to, uh -huh. like Sebastian Lelio. Oh, he did? He would do 15 takes of me putting my glasses on my head. No kidding. Yeah. And I, at first, we didn't, we didn't really, you know, we didn't know each other, and uh, I thought he just didn't like what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And he didn't understand that um, that was unusual for independent film, because usually you're hurrying. Yeah. But he, if, he has, if he has a half an hour to shoot something, he's going to do enough takes to fill up a half an hour. That's just how he works. Mm -hmm. So you also have to learn to let that go, too. Yeah. Like whatever situation you're in. Yeah. What I was trying to say to the kids at, at BU mm -hmm. today, too, because they were talking about rehearsal in film versus rehearsal in theater, mm -hmm. and they're theatrically trained. Um, is that you can't, you need to be, for me, I need to be very, very prepared on film. Emotion prepared, I have to know my text, I have yeah. to be ready to do it, but I want, I want the emotional act, I want that thing to happen to me on camera. Mm -hmm. So the camera sees me feeling it, not, not thinking about it coming before, right. not constructing it. Yeah. So, and that to me is what's so electric about film. Yeah. When you, for example, if you're watching, if you've ever watched a movie and seen somebody blush on camera, it's the weirdest sensation because you go, you're like, how that, how they do that, yeah. you know? And they're not, they can't construct it. Right. It's they have to feel it. It has to be natural. Yeah. yeah. Talking about talking with the young people today is making me think about your stint on As the World Turns, which is how many of us discovered you, <laughs> and how if you are a fan of daytime drama, which I am, I discovered a lot of people that I that I followed throughout their careers, whether they stayed in daytime drama or went on to bigger things. Right. Right. That doesn't exist as much anymore. In fact, it doesn't exist much at all. I th how many shows, are, are there any shows left? Some are on the web and online, yeah. and I think there's still a couple on, oh, but it's man. changed dramatically, yeah, yeah, as you yeah. know. I mean, so what do you, I mean, isn't that a huge loss for young actors? I think so, I think so too, because it was this opportunity to go to work every single yeah. day, yeah. and you only, you know, that's how, that's how we all learn best, by actually, we all, we all know that, no matter what we do, by actually doing something, by physically doing it, by, through repetition, mm -hmm. you know, that's how, that's how we acquire skills. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, to have that opportunity at, at 23, to go to work every single day yeah. and be terrible, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that yeah. was invaluable. It, yeah. really, it really was. Trade you. Well, you, you won an Emmy, so I, I don't think you were exactly terrible, but, well, um, and I would... My voice was so bad. It was like this, it was very affected. <laughs> and I want to see you again. Is that why you kissed me yesterday? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to us, Franny? <laughs> Which I told the students today. I said, yeah. you know, I said I found that when I was, I was, had been theatrically trained, so mm -hmm. if I were, I felt like I had a lot of purchase if I were in a great piece of material yeah. with, and with a lot of structure around me and, and with um, a style or something. I had a lot to hang it on. Mm -hmm. But take away the language and take away something, you know, and, and not, you know, the fact that it's very, it's, it's rapidly written, let's say, to be generous. Um, yeah. So there's no, so you don't have the language, you don't have a style, you don't have anything yeah. but your, you know. Your presence. But your presence. Yeah, and so, yeah. So your voice is all over the place, <laughs> and my face is all over, you know, so I had to learn yeah. how, like, how do I get rid of that stuff? How do I, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you worked on Safe with Todd Haynes, um, you were right there at the birth of this independent cinema yeah. movement of the, of the mid-90s, early 90s, mid-90s with Todd, Christine Vachon. I mean, you couldn't have known then what it would mean, but yeah. now looking back on it, what, what was that like and how important was that to you? I, I mean, it, you just... It was miraculous. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was, for, it was a miraculous time in cinema. I mean, for all those people who, you know, everybody was like the 70s, the 70s, the 70s, and you look at those mm -hmm. beautiful movies that were made in the 70s, and, and then there were the 80s. And all the movies were about car washes and, um, I don't know, it's just stuff that I couldn't get, you know? I, I, you know, I was working in television, I was doing theater off-Broadway and stuff, but I could not get a movie, I really couldn't. Yeah. And so there was a certain point where I thought, all right, well, 
I'm my career will be in television yeah. and, and in probably off Broadway or you know regional because I wasn't getting Broadway stuff either. Like that's it. And then suddenly this thing happened. You know, this people started making these movies. The idea was by an independent film that you were making a movie for very little, yeah. you know, maybe a million or under, and you weren't expected to make it back. Mm -hmm. All you had to do was, you, was just to make back your, the costs. Yeah. You weren't going to make box office. It was really about how do we keep it low so that we don't have to feel this financial burden. Yeah. And so, so then, then people were taking these huge chances with movies that, that you know, we, we'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, I was. So what happened to me was that I ended up doing safe mm -hmm. shortcuts, and then Vanya on 42nd Street was yeah. made into a film, and then they all came out yeah. in the same year. Yeah. So I went from somebody who had no film career right. and was a TV actress yeah. to somebody who was suddenly an artist. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, how'd that happen? <laughs> that's... You know, that's what's interesting yeah. to perception. Because mm -hmm. I don't, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was a different, I'm, I'm, hopefully I was a different actor than I was when I had that horrible voice and stuff. <laughs> I, you know, I hope I'd moved away from that. So I had moved away from that, but I was still the same actor, you know, when I was supposedly in television, and then I was this, you know, artistic one. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's really, really important mm -hmm. to look at somebody's work, not mm -hmm. to look at the medium, mm -hmm. to look at who, the work that they're doing okay. wherever yeah. they are, and, mm -hmm. and to know that you know, it, often its perspective has mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. Of course, it led to a, an amazing creative partnership with, with, with Todd, Todd Haynes. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've made four movies together. Yeah. And, and, and let me tell you, when yeah. I saw Safe, when mm -hmm. I saw the script, mm -hmm. I was making a movie called Roommates in, in Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and it sound, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, and I was, believe me, actually it was kind of cool. It was D.B. Sweeney and Peter Falk, who was amazing, and Ellen Burstyn as well. So, but it was a nice family movie. You yeah. know, it was, it was um, sweet. And I got this script, <laughs> I got this script, and I, I was like, I said, who is this? What is this? What is this? Who's doing this? Why isn't this cast? Yep. I mean, I couldn't believe that there wasn't an actor attached to it. Right. And I flew home to New York from Pittsburgh, and um, I, I wore a pair of white jeans and a white T-shirt. And I, and I was like, this, and I thought, I, don't, I can only see you doing it one way. And if he doesn't agree with mm -hmm. me, then I'm the wrong person yep. for this. And um, I walked in, and Todd was there. And I did the first scene, and I, he said, OK. And I said, OK. I did the second one, he went, okay. I said, okay, and then when we just do one more, and I was like, okay? <laughs> and he said, okay, thank you. I said, okay, bye. <laughs> and evidently, he turned to Christine and said, that's Carol White. Really? And, and what's weird about the my relationship with Todd is that we don't talk a lot mm -hmm. about it. You know, we, I feel like I can hear it with the way he writes, and I don't, um, and we don't have to explain ourselves to each other. Mm -hmm. um, there was one moment in Safe where I throw up. It's when Xander Berkeley is holding me and it looks like I'm crying. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember. And I start to go mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And then um, he said, and then when you throw up, st st stop, turn your head, throw up, and throw up on the bed. Mm. I was like, what? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He goes, just throw up on the bed. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. That's not how I saw it. Yep. And I said, no, she just goes like this and throws up. And he said, I know, I know. It's just the locations was worried about the rug because we can't afford <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> so what was yeah. interesting is the one time we disagreed. It yeah. wasn't an artistic thing. He was right. just trying to make an accommodation. But he's so <laughs> wonderful. He's so smart mm -hmm. and tells a story in every single frame. Mm -hmm. With, there's, not, there's, not a, there's not a word or a beat that's not meaningful mm -hmm. in his writing, and there's not a frame that's not telling you the story. Mm -hmm. And there's so, talk about scaffolding, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you have, you have so much purchase Support. in his films. Yeah. It's, just, it's easy. He yeah. does so much for you. Now, of course, you made Far From Heaven, one of your iconic roles, Oscar-nominated role. And I heard that you modeled Kathy Whitaker on Doris Day, for one. I don't know if there were any others, but that was a primary. I loved Doris Day, you know. Um, just, she, you know, her movies, those movies were always on TV when I was a little girl. 
And I love the quality of her voice. Yeah. Um, I have a tendency to go up in pitch, mm-hmm. oh, and and I, I didn't want Kathy Whitaker to do that. Mm-hmm. I wanted her. First of all, I wanted her to be a kind of an iconic blonde. Todd Roeder is a redhead, and you know yeah. it looks like I have red hair the way the way the tone is in that. But that was actually a blonde. Blonde. Wig. Yeah. It was a warm yeah. blonde, but it was blonde. I said yeah. she should be, an, the ideal American mm-hmm. blonde. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and have it's like like Doris Day. Yeah. Like Doris yeah. Day was yeah. that person. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. she just was our ideal. And and she had a very soothing, very beautiful, mm-hmm. very, you know, really lovely. This lovely voice. And I would say to Todd, make if I go up, make sure I, I come down. You know, again, um, because it's 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 very, it's assured too. Because um, this is a person who does feel sure of who she is in the world, At and the and then suddenly yeah. is not suddenly her identity mm-hmm. completely changes mm-hmm. when she falls in love with this man. Yeah, Doris Day. You, you, were you did you know Douglas Sirk's work? Because that of course is so influential. You did Hell not. Hell no. no? <laughs> uh-uh. I just watch TV. Okay. So that's yeah. so. But you know, yeah. yeah. But I should have. But I didn't. Yeah. So yeah. but when I knew. What, this is how I, I learned about film in Boston at these theaters. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so growing up, I watched television, yeah. and I and I um, I went to whatever movie was on, mm-hmm. you know, at the theater, and and saw lots of challenging movies. Sometimes in Alaska, when I was we were there for a year, the movie changed every Saturday, and sometimes you see like Aristocats. And then another time, I saw Minnie and Moskowitz, the yeah. Cassavetes oh film. Oh my God! Yes, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff. Uh, you know, once again, there was a curator yes, of that. Yeah. And then, so then, and then the army. You just yeah. you know, the army theaters. It's yeah. popular stuff. But then when I came to Boston, yeah. there were all these theaters like this one, yeah. like the Brattle, mm-hmm. like Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. She remind, I couldn't think of the name of it. Yes, and I could, she just reminded me of, the, of that, where I learned about Godard and yeah. Truffaut and amazing. Fassbender and, yeah. and, the, and, and Robert Altman. Yeah. And suddenly it was like, what, what is this? You know, who are directors? Yeah. What, what, are they, what, are they, what are they saying? Why is yeah. this different? Um, but that's, that's why I wanted to come here tonight. Yeah. That mm-hmm. you know, that's why I wanted to come to the Coolidge Corner Theater because I saw a racer head here, <laughs> and everybody was high. Um, <laughs> and, but it was, you know, this was it's, it was magical mm-hmm. to go and to get on the T and go to Cambridge and and go and see the last Metro. Um, mm-hmm. I saw a double double bill in Cambridge too: Straw Dogs and Emmanuel. Wow. Okay. Wow. So yeah. e- you saw ev- everything. Everything. Yeah. The whole scope yeah. of and, uh, you know, everything. And yeah. so I don't think I realized how much yeah. it got under my skin. Yeah. What my, expect- my expectations were so high mm. for material. Mm-hmm. So, I th- so I actually feel like when I encountered it again in independent film, when I started seeing scripts that were reflecting what I had seen in the, yeah. in the, in the movies in, in Boston, it kind of it woke me up, and, yeah. you know, and things really changed. You knew the kinds of films you you responded to. I totally and wanted did. to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. From my experience yeah, with these theaters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another one of those is Maps to the Stars. Yeah. I just rewatched it, yeah. knowing I was going to talk to you, and oh my God, it's rough. It I is. Know. It is unbelievable <laughs> um, your performance, and of course you 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 have won an Oscar, but the Cannes Film Festival to get best, for an American actress to get best actress Thank for you. that, that is, was, was a big deal, it wasn't it? It was a really big deal. I was um, shocked. <laughs> I was really, really shocked because yeah, it's, a, it's French, you know, and Americans don't, don't, don't normally, win. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and somebody said, I actually had won Berlin mm-hmm. and um, Venice, mm-hmm. and I, there's a European journalist was asked me, do you want to? Do you think you'll win Can? I was like, no way! I'm not winning Can. Right. Like right. that doesn't happen. Right. Um, so that was um, that was really gratifying. Yeah. Um, and I love that movie, and I love David Cronenberg. Yeah. And, yeah. and talk about a, a, a true artist and um, um, a, a real iconoclast, you know, um, and somebody yeah. who's he's interesting. You know, David doesn't. David likes to do sometimes one take. Maybe two, wow. because he comes from um, 
a, a tradition of working with non-actors. He started with non-actors, mm -hmm. so he didn't work with people who could build a performance. Mm -hmm. So if he was gonna get it, he was gonna get it fast, mm -hmm. and then he would move on. So now that's sort of his habit mm -hmm. to, to, to the extent that in that long monologue I have in Maps of the Stars, when I'm at the Chateau Marmont and I'm doing the whole audition, that was yes. near the end of the film. And I loved, I loved Bruce Wagner's writing. I think mm -hmm. his writing is just beautiful and tremendous. And, and I'd done this speech, and David was like, got it, moving on. One take. One take. Wow. And I actually had to say, listen, I said, just let me do it one more time, just because I'm not ready to say goodbye to it. <laughs> I love this. I, I just it. wanted yeah, to yeah, do yeah, it yeah. one yeah. more time. It's such a trenchant look at the Hollywood movie industry. Yeah. Did you base Savannah on, I mean, who, what did, how did you get to her? She's like the... You know, she's like the worst of all of us, right? <laughs> you know, she's our worst. She's just like, she's so needy and so awful and so, and she's so childlike. I mean, mm -hmm. if your child were acting this way, you'd be like, mm -hmm. sit down, time out, you know? Right. But she, that's exactly it. Yeah. She doesn't have a mother. Yeah. It's all about not having a mother yeah. and, and being allowed to have her and having her needs are so outside, yeah. so outrageous. I mean, I see it happen, it can happen in any business where, where somebody is infantilized and indulged, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I see it happen with grown-ups in my business. I see it happen with, act with real children and stuff yeah. too because somebody wants something from them yeah. and so they're indulging it so that they can get it. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not indulging it because they want to, they want something for themselves. So it's so damaging, it's so, so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, she's, she's pitiful too, you know, Havana Sagrand, because everyone is, they just want what they want. They yeah. don't care about her. Yeah. Well, she's quite sympathetic in your hands. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it would be. But, I mean, we think, I think, many people think of Cronenberg as a horror film director. And right. there's certainly elements of horror in Maps to the Stars, though others as well. But you've done several legitimate horror films. I mean, Carrie and Psycho and Hannibal. Right, uh, right, Is right. that a genre you really like? I do like horror. I do. <laughs> I like the devil more than I like knives. <laughs> I don't think there are enough devil movies. Mm -hmm. I really don't, because I think that's truly scary. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that I think slashers. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I, I, look, slashers. Just, you know, that's that is scary stuff. But I think that psychological horror and that idea that that uh, any movie where the paranoia turns out to pay off, real something really is happening. I I love I love that. Like The Exorcist or yeah. Rosemary's, Rosemary's Baby, Baby yeah. or any yeah. of that. Yeah. And I yeah. think, well, interestingly enough. You know, in troubled times, mm -hmm. um, we we are we those monsters that all those anxieties that we are experiencing start to manifest as monsters in our entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I do think that they serve a purpose. You know, mm -hmm. in, in in Hannibal, um, mm -hmm. it's you know he's he eats people and he's he's the hero. You know, he's the antihero, right? We root we root for him, but he's the monster inside us too. He's the us that wants to eat people and, yeah. and win. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll be doing more horror uh, in the well, future. Well, I'm doing this um, Stephen King adaptation of a Stephen King book called Lisey's Story, which is a romance and kind of horror fantasy. So I, I'm excited about that. Well, that's very exciting. That's great. Um, I have to ask you this uh, because I'm a classic movie fanatic and um, every once in a while on Turner Classic Movies they air that lovely tribute you did to Myrna Loy. Aww, yeah. It is absolutely beautiful and you speak so eloquently about her and you talk about this great scene she has in the best years of our lives and uh, I just wondered how that came about and did you choose her or did they ask they you to do it? They asked me to do it and I don't even, I don't remember how it happened, but it, I was delighted to do it. And I read, you know, she wrote, a, she wrote an autobiography too, which I read, and I was so struck by her life, her choices, her relationships, um, her integrity, um, her consistency. Um, you know, I think when we see actors and actresses, we think sometimes in terms of their 
their famous roles yeah. or, or when they were most potent or popular, mm -hmm. but you don't always think about the, their lives and their, and their relationships and, and where, they, where they were at 15 versus where they were at 75, if they're lucky enough to get to 75 or, you know. So, so with Myrna Loy, I, I, she seemed to be someone who really truly had a life, mm -hmm. who was, a, who was a, an artist, a very particular kind of artist and also had a life and that interested me. Mm -hmm. Mm, mm. That's yeah. beautiful. I love when they put that on, but you can get it on, online if anyone wants yeah. to see it. You do. Um, so you, you've got another movie coming out this year. I mean, you've got movies coming out all the time, uh, but um, After the Wedding, which yes. is yes. When, a movie that your husband, Bart, Bart Freundlich, mm -hmm. um, wrote and directed, and you're going to star with Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams and Billy Crudup, and a really lovely young actress named Abby Quinn. There are a lot of cineasts here, so you maybe know Suzanne of Beers, Yes. Uh, original after the wedding, which was 12 years ago, and it starred two men, Mads Mikkelsen and um, an another Swedish guy whose name I can't remember, which is terrible. But anyway, um, my husband had been hired to do an American adaptation, um, and he was kind of watching the movie, and I was watching it with him, and I hadn't seen it. And the the other role of this business person, I was watching it, and I said, hmm. I said, that's a part I'd like to play. <laughs> and, then, and then I didn't think anything about mm -hmm. it. And as they were developing it, they came up with this idea of switching. You know, how, why do you remake something? What are you, what are you kind of saying? What is it, what's going to be different about it? And, and they came up with this idea of switching the genders uh -huh. so that it was two women. And, and it made it a much... Uh, I mean, then right away I was like, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. But it made it a much more complicated story because okay. there's a there's something that's unknown in the original film that has to be known um, in this one. And I also had never seen, it was two, you know, two women who made different life choices who, who were equally powerful. And um, I think also equally sure of their own choices. Neither one of them, I don't think they, they did question what, what they'd done. And, and they're kind of in a, they're a little bit in a power struggle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was very, it was really interesting mm -hmm. for, for me to play. That's It'll be out later this year, after the wedding. Hopefully they'll be here. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, then I'm sure you're gonna be terrific and you get to work with, with Michelle Williams, yeah. who right now is burning it up as Gwen Verdon. Uh, I haven't seen it oh, yet. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah it's, it's, she's quite amazing. So I'm sure yeah. you had a lot of fun working yeah. with her. Uh, now this is your fourth film with Bart, yeah. right? And you met on the Myth of Independence. Independence. Yeah. His first movie. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how that came about and that first film. Did you know right away, not that you were in love with him or that you wanted to, but, but right. as a director, mm -hmm. that he got you or that he that it was somebody you wanted to work with regardless of the personal? You know, it was interesting because he caught me at a very bad time um, because I was, had just been divorced <laughs> and I was really grumpy, super, super grumpy, really mad and disappointed and, and kind of, uh, I felt like, um, it was just, yeah, it was just grumpy. Yeah. You know, a divorce Bad can time. do that to you. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I had been married in my 20s, and, yeah. um, and it took a while to extricate my You know, I was personally unhappy. I yeah. was, I, you know, I loved working and stuff, but I was, so I kind of managed to extricate myself. And, and um, when I met him, I had, I looked at a bunch of scripts, and this one really stood out, and I thought it was very interesting, but um, I was supposed to meet him at a hotel to talk about it, but my... Um, car broke down because the guy that I was seeing, not my ex-husband, my boyfriend, had crashed it. So I had a lot of reasons to be grumpy, right? Um, so when I got to this meeting, I was, I was like two hours late and I kept calling and saying, I'm oh, sorry that I was late. And, and I was very abrupt with him. I said, listen, why do you want me to do this movie? Mm -hmm. and, and I said, I want to let you know that I said, the script is 130 pages. Mm -hmm. I said, it's going to have to be shorter. And if my pages get cut, I don't want to do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was so patient and I was just awful. And um, he said, and I, when I said to him, I said, so what is it, what, why do you see me in this character? Mm -hmm. What do you see? And um, he said, because you look like you're two different people um, when, you, you know, when your face is in complete repose and when you smile. Mm -hmm. Because you have a, a duality to your mm -hmm. physicality. Okay. And I went, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
And then I, and I was like, okay. And at the end of the meeting, I was pretty sure I was going to do the meeting and he and do the movie. And he was thought it was disastrous. Okay. And yeah. um, he got up and left because I said, I look, I have to go. I have another meeting. I did actually. It was terrible. I was meeting my agent across the room, and so I went and sat with my agent. And Bart got up and left, and I was like, I'm going to do that kids movie. <laughs> <laughs> that kids movie. <laughs> He was 26. Okay. And yeah. yeah, so yeah. it was his first movie. And, yeah. and you know, yeah, I'm older than him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's, um, that's, that's how we met. And he, yeah. But he was very, the thing that people always ask how directors are different. And I always say, it's, it's, everybody's different. We're all different, right? But what is it that, a, that the directors, that really, really great directors share? And it's they, they, they share a clarity of vision. Mm -hmm. It's their own vision. It doesn't have to be the same as anybody else's, but they're clear about what their vision is. They know where the shot is. They know what they're trying to say. They have a style. Um, and, and when they can communicate that to you, then you can do your job because you have to, you have to be able to communicate yeah. their vision. But he was very, very clear about what he wanted to accomplish. Yeah. And saying you had a, a duality, um, that's, that term is, that was 1997. That has since been used to describe you. Yeah. But that's quite perceptive. Yeah. Well, it was actually before that, because our child was born in 1997. That, well, I guess 1990. Okay. The film came out in 97, so this would have yeah. been like 96. 96, actually, yeah. we had a baby pretty quickly. OK, well. <laughs> Things worked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I know, and he is 21, that baby, and wow. is, you know, a junior in college, and our daughter is 17 and is looking at schools. And it's so, that's what's so crazy about being back here in Boston and thinking about my college experience mm -hmm. when I have kids who are yeah. basically in that. You know, same age. That same space. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. Do your kids want to go into into the business? No, 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 no. no. My well, our son actually is very interested in music and okay. in film composition. So mm -hmm. that's something that he's that's so that's but that's recent. He never had, was interested. Our daughter, um, when I asked her why she didn't go out for the play, she said because that's for losers, mom. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thinking about the drama club kids, you know, and I was like, well, I went out for the, oh, okay, yeah, 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 but, you know, I don't know. I also think that it's a lot in her life, yeah. you know, her dad's a filmmaker, her mom's an actor, it's yeah. all over the place, and I think that, you know, when you're 17, that's, yeah. she was a PA on After the Wedding, uh -huh. yeah. um, and she was great, she was really, really good at it, but uh, I don't know that she found it that yeah. interesting. Yeah, may have, may be too close. Yeah. Just, yeah. 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 So I also have to ask you about the, the Gloria Steinem film, it's called sure. The Glory is a Life on the Road, yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're done with it, you completed it? Yeah, I have, we actually have two days of pickups because mm -hmm. I think we ran out of money and um, need to get a little more money, which is not unusual. Um, but it is not a straight-up biopic. It's based on Gloria Steinem's autobiography, yeah. My Life on the Road. And it has, um, there, are f there are several Glorias. There's a nine-year-old Gloria, a 14-year-old Gloria. Al Alicia Vikander plays one Gloria. I play another Gloria. Bette Midler plays Bella Abzug. Lorraine Toussaint plays Flo Kennedy. Janelle Monet plays Dorothy Pittman Hughes. Um, it's a really um, cool meditation on Gloria Steinem and the, wow. and the women's movement. Yeah. So, but it's yeah. Julie Taymor, so yeah. it's not realistic. Yeah. You know, it's not realistic. Yeah. It's very um, it's impressionistic. Like a, yeah, impressionistic. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you research? Did you, did you meet with her? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I did. You know, I read everything that I could and watched footage, and then. Uh, got to actually meet her. I'd met her tangentially. I'd like some times up things, and, and, but never really had been alone with her. And she is everything that you would hope she wow. would be. She yeah. is a true leader and um, incredibly open and tolerant and funny and um, always teaching in the gentlest of ways, always yeah. um, never lets anything slip, you know? Mm. She'll, she'll be like, hey, you know, maybe this is why this happened, or maybe pay attention to that, or um, she's uh, really extraordinary, and I think will be, 
you know, she's a major, major figure yeah. in yeah. our in our culture. Mm. Yeah. Julie Taymor, you mentioned you you've worked with several uh, prominent directors who happen to be women: Lisa Cholodenko, Kimberly Pierce, uh, Rebecca um, Miller. Miller yeah. um, is is that changing at all that you can see within the industry that more yeah, women are? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's not it's it's not changing rapidly, mm -hmm. but it is changing. I mean, I think that. That a few years ago nobody even talked about it. Yeah. Nobody even talked yeah. about you know women not being. We're you know we're fifty one percent of the population. We are not a minority. It's it's, it's important that women not be treated as a special interest mm -hmm. group too. Mm -hmm. that we don't talk about like female films or female directors. It's like that thing where people would say about being gay married. It's like no, you're married. Mm -hmm. You know, it's marriage equality. It's like um, you know, so you want you basically want gender equality as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do we have to stop? I, had, I got the rap sign, so Are you kidding? I'm gonna. Yeah, I, 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 I wish we had oh more gosh. time. I didn't get to so much, uh, but this I, has been such a pleasure. I, feel like I talked too much. Uh, no, you did not. Uh, <laughs> this has been so great. Thank you so much. Uh, you were terrific. Very terrific. So now we're going to welcome to the stage Michael Maynard and Kathy Tallman, who will present the Coolidge Award. Not nearly as interesting, I must say. <laughs> Thank you so much, that was terrific. I couldn't find the uh, silk gloves, so I'm sorry I put some fingerprints on this. <laughs> but we are so proud to have you here, so thankful for not only your being here, but your entire career, what you've done for the film industry, and uh, we are so happy to be able to show your wonderful work. So this is the Coolidge Award, honoring Julianne Moore. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come back. Thank you. Move along here. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you, I just honest, <laughs> honestly, th this is really very, very special. I don't know if you know how special, I mean, I keep trying to tell you that to be back in Boston and to be in a, in, in a theater and in a town that's formative to, that was formative to who I am as a, not just a human being, but as, a, as an actor, a place where, that, what, the place that inspired me to be a film actor, it's truly extraordinary. I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very, very much. It's, a, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. and the Julianne does it. And uh, keep coming, keep supporting us, support our expansion. Yeah. Um, we are expanding because you want us to expand. We don't have enough space to give you all that you want. We've got lots more to give you, as, to, uh, as do Julianne and the industry. So thank you so much, and come back again. Many, many thanks, and I want to put a special thanks to the Coolidge staff who once again put together an extraordinary event. Thank you. Yeah.